afternoon and welcome to today's webinar produced by intellectual property law firm Stern, Tesler, Goldstein and Fox. Today's topic is what is left for diagnostics? This is the third in a three-part series of webinars focused on the impact of the new Patent and Trademark Office Section 101 guidelines in a number of subject areas. All lines have been placed in a listen-only mode. However, if you have a question during today's presentation, please submit it via the chat box located at the bottom of the control panel on the right side of your screen. If we don't have a chance to answer your question prior to the end of today's discussion, we'll follow up directly to make sure you receive an answer. As I've already noted in the chat box, if you'd like to receive a copy of today's slides or a link to the recording, this, this webinar will be recorded, please send an email request to Aaron West at ewest.skgf.com. Today's presenters are Michelle Hollaback and Marsha Rose Gillentine. At this point, it's my pleasure to turn the call over to Michelle. Thanks, Erin. So as Erin mentioned, this is a three-part series, and this is the, the third part. Uh, the two series before, we've included links to those, uh, those presentations in case you're interested in, in following up on some more detail. Uh, the first one went into detail on biotech and chemical patents and how these guidelines apply. And the second one went into detail on software and tips and tricks for prosecuting software applications. And today we are uh, met with the confluence of those two topics in discussing diagnostics. A little bit of an agenda, we'll spend a minute on historical context and why subject matter eligibility, or Section 101 as we call it, matters for diagnostics. We'll discuss the guidelines relevance to the actual products generated and tools used in the diagnostics industry, what they mean and how they apply. We'll talk generally about strategies for protecting diagnostic innovation, and then we'll finish up with some tips for handling application drafting, for new innovation, and prosecution tips for applications that have already been filed. So why are diagnostics applications so difficult to prosecute, especially with the one-on-one scenario that we're in? Well, the diagnostics industry bridges the gap between what is traditionally biotech or chemical and what is traditionally software and algorithmic. A lot of diagnostics innovation falls somewhere in the gray area between those. So in terms of the new 101 guidelines, which issued on uh, December 16th, uh, I believe, they deal with both naturally occurring case law and they also deal with abstract idea uh, analysis and trying to address both of those uh, can be challenging. Just a little bit of historical context on eligibility. So this comes, of course, from 35 U.S.C. 101. That's what determines what is uh, patentable subject matter. And there, I guess that particular statute was developed in 1952. That's when it was brought into law. And things were pretty quiet for the next 20 years until the 70s where there was a glut of, uh, of Supreme Court cases that resulted in the three judicial exceptions. So those are listed here, the law of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract idea. So these are things that the courts have carved out as not being eligible for patenting. And you can see in that first little group there, uh, Benson, Fluke, and Deere primarily dealt with software and mathematical algorithms. The Chakrabarty case, of course, uh, dealt with genetically modified organisms and, and whether they were patentable and, and found that they were, as long as they were non-naturally occurring. Uh, and then things were pretty quiet up until uh, the mid-1990s. And in the 90s, business method and software applications started to flourish. Um, and then there were some high-profile cases there that uh, made the, the public and the courts, I guess, look a little bit more closely at, um, at statutory subject matter and, and what the PTO was doing. Recently, we've had the trifecta of Bilski, Mayo, and Alice. Of course, Bilski dealt with business methods. Mayo dealt with uh, pharmace pharmaceutical product diagnostics. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that case. And Alice dealt with uh, software uh, in the financial space. But at any rate, all those uh, prompted a new set of interim guidelines last June. The Federal Circuit has been pretty active since the Alice decision in June. 
And uh, the PTO has tried to incorporate those decisions into its guidance as well. So it's not an easy task, um, but as I mentioned on December 16th, they issued their new interim guidelines, and that brings us to today. So I'll turn it over to Marcia to get into some details on how they affect nature-based products. Well, as Michelle mentioned, diagnostics in, in, um, involve both nature-based products as well as abstract ideas, so you have to consider both. The nature-based products, according to the PTO guidelines, is a term that refers to all types of products that are examined, and they include both patent-eligible and ineligible products, as well as naturally occurring products and even man-made products. So there are examples that accompanied the guidelines, and the PTO provided a number of examples, gunpowder, a beverage composition, a naturally occurring pharmaceutical, purified proteins, genetically modified bacterium, a mixture of bacteria, nucleic acids, antibodies, cells, and food. Uh, the, the examples are very detailed. They provide a lot of facts and um, hypotheticals where it will give good guidance on how to respond to an examiner's rejection depending on the subject matter of the claim at issue. So the new guidance maintains the two-part test for judicial exception to patentability. The first is step A. Does the nature-based product limitation exhibit markedly different characteristics from its naturally occurring counterpart? This is kind of the gatekeeper for the test. If the answer is yes, that there are markedly different characteristics from the naturally occurring counterpart, then the claim is deemed eligible because it is not directed to a, um, a nature exception. So you don't have to do the second part of the test. Um, if the claim does not have a markedly different characteristic from the naturally occurring counterpart, then you do undergo the second part of the test, which is step 2B, um, which is does the claim recite additional elements that amount to significantly more than the judicial exception. So step 2A, which is part one of the Mayo test. So going back to the previous slide, it's, um, you have to determine whether the claim is directed to a law of nature, a natural product, or an abstract idea. The guidelines specify that directed to means recited in the claim. If the claim is not directed to a law of nature, as I said, you skip the second part of the test, and the subject matter qualifies as uh, eligible subject matter. However, um, there is a streamlined analysis that's available even if the, the claim is directed to a law of nature, a natural product, or an abstract idea, as long as the, um, the invention does not preempt the public from using a natural product. Um, and that streamlined analysis also applies to the abstract idea concept. And, uh, you know, if the um, abstract idea, you know, is recited, such a uh, mathematical algorithm, for example, if that's recited in the claim but it's clearly being used for a specific purpose, then the examiner can skip the analysis. The example that the Patent Office gives for what might be uh, examined under this streamlined analysis is a robotic arm that uses a mathematical algorithm for its movement. So it does recite, and I should mention that uh, you know when it, we have it up there on the side, directed to, I think a lot of people, when they see a claim is directed to something, they think, what is the, the general subject matter of this claim? But the way the Patent Office is interpreting this term, they say directed to means recited in the claim. So as long as it's in there somewhere, it's, it's considered directed to. So if you had a claim for the robotic arm, for example, that had a mathematical algorithm, um, the robotic arm is clearly something in the physical world, um, and assuming that it's novel, uh, is, is eligible for patenting there. Um, it gets a little bit more questionable once you get into the um, uh, non-naturally occurring subject matter, and then also in software a lot of times we deal with the abstract idea. Almost every single, uh, every single case has that come up at some point. And uh, it's my understanding from the rules that the if you have a mixture of a natural product and a non-natural product, it's still going to be examined under the natural product 
rules. So having that non-natural product is not going to take it necessarily outside of having to go through step 2B, that you're still going to have to go through step 2B. So just having a mixture of a natural product with something else, you're going to have to show that that mixture has markedly different characteristics than just the natural product in and of itself. Um, so the PTO guidelines does give some examples of law of nature and natural phenomenon. Of course, the isolated DNA from myriad, the correlation that is the consequence of how a certain compound is metabolized in the body from Mayo, and then two very old Supreme Court cases <laughs> from uh, the very late 1800s, electromagnetism to transmit signals, and then the chemical principle underlying the union between fatty elements and water. On the abstract idea side, I won't go through all of these, but the guidelines list some exemplary cases. I'm sure you've started to see a trend here. These are all examples from existing cases that have been decided uh, either by the Supreme Court or by the Federal Circuit. Uh, they did try and take into account, at least from the abstract idea side, some of the more recent cases. Um, one thing that's interesting to note here is that you know, some of these cases were ultimately found uh, where the, the claims were patent eligible. So one that sticks out is the Deere case, the fourth from the bottom. And this just underscores what the patent office is saying is, you know, it will be considered to have an abstract idea. The claim will be considered to have an abstract idea just if it's recited. There may be additional subject matter in there that brings it into eligibility. Like in the Deere case, that's what recited a mathematical algorithm for determining the cure time of rubber. Uh, even though those claims were found eligible for patenting, just the fact that they recited the mathematical algorithm meant that they had an abstract idea on the claims. So in step two, uh, two B of the Mayo test, the PTO guidelines indicate that the examiner should decide whether any element or combination of elements in the claim uh, is sufficient to be significantly more than the judicial except than the judicial exception. So does the claim recite sort of more limitations outside of um, extra solution activity or data gathering steps, things like that, uh, that, that really bring an inventive concept to the claims? What they're trying to do is make sure that, that you know, they're applying the exception in a meaningful way. It's not just a broad uh, claim of the exception used in a particular field or uh, that might preempt usage of that judicial exception um, in, in a particular uh, uh, manner. One thing to note is that each claim has to be examined individually based on those elements and shouldn't be uh, lumped together with other claims. We've seen this a lot in office actions uh, before the guidelines came out, but certainly post the Alice and Mayo decisions where um, a judicial exception was recited, and then the examiner would lump all the dependent claims in with the independent claim and say that they were uh, not patent eligible for the same reason as the independent claim. Uh, what the guidelines point out is that each of those claim elements matters. Um, even if an independent claim is not patent eligible, there may be additional meaningful limitations in some of the dependent claims that have to be addressed. Uh, similarly, all elements of the independent claim have to be addressed as well, and the examiner has to explain why uh, a, a particular element is not considered to be a meaningful limitation. They have to look at it element by element, and then they also have to look at it as a whole. So the examiners are uh, being guided in these, in these instructions to really put forth a clear, detailed analysis of the claims. And if they, if they don't do that, then they haven't complied with the guidelines. So what is this significantly more that we keep talking about? You know, what makes a claim um, you know, recite more than the judicial exception such that it's eligible for patenting? Uh, what's listed here are things that come from the guidelines, improvements to another technology or technical field. Um, if you have a, a computer-based claim, improvements to the functioning of the computer itself. Uh, if you're using a particular machine, this is the you know, machine or transformation step along with the next aspect. If you're actually transforming an article to a different state or thing, 
Um, that's an, an issue as well. Uh, it was one of the, the issues in Mayo, if you recall, where uh, there was a transformation, but it was it was the what the claim was claiming was just the observation of that. It wasn't claiming the actual transformation, um, and, uh, and and so that's one uh, problem with with those claims. Um, the first two pieces of theirs to go back to the first two bullets, those are uh, from Alice, uh, which dealt primarily with software, and then of course adding a specific unconventional limitation or step. Uh, as the last bullet there. And that one's interesting, you know, unconventional, we typically think of that as being relevant to novelty and unobviousness. And the patent office and the courts have really been trying to say that no, they still consider novelty and unobvious to be a completely separate analysis, but at the same time they recognize that fundamental concepts, um, things that have been in the art for a while that are generally understood uh, as to have existed in a particular industry, you know, if they're if they're if they are conventional, um, then that will not help the claim uh, become eligible. One other thing to note about that is um, even in the ultramercial case, which recently came out of the federal circuit, um, the ultramercial court noted that the claim recited unconventional limitations and still found the claim not patent eligible. So. You know, these are, are guidelines given from the Patent Office. They're not guarantees that reciting these things uh, will make your claims eligible, but uh, it, it certainly can't hurt, and it gives you, as you're prosecuting claims or trying to defend uh, existing patents, it certainly gives you a, a hook for saying that, they, uh, that the claims do recite significantly more. What is not significantly more? Uh, that's sort of easier to deal with in many cases. We have a lot of examples from the courts and from the patent office uh, where claims have been found non-statutory. So certainly reciting a method and just saying apply it uh, in a particular field or apply it on a computer, um, things like that, that's not going to be very helpful. Uh, that kind of comes from the, uh, the, the fluke decision where it was alarm limits. I guess there was a mathematical algorithm to calculate an alarm limit, and um, you know, it was just output at the end. Uh, that wasn't sig you know, significantly more in that case. If you have a software-based tool, you know, a methodology where you're implementing the idea on a computer, just saying that it's implemented on a computer without anything more isn't going to help you out in this situation. Uh, the converse of what we talked about before, if you just have routine and conventional activities, uh, particularly if they're listed with, with generality, uh, it's not going to be helpful either. And uh, I think we've talked about the other, other bullets as well. So, you know, the examiner is given those guidelines, and the examiner is given very explicit details on what it has to do. And we talked about this a little bit, um, but one nice thing for uh, practitioners and patent applicants are the specific instructions to the examiners of essentially the boxes they have to check when they're making a 101 rejection. So they have to identify the judicial exception explicitly and refer to where it's recited in the claim. Uh, a lot of what we were seeing from the examiners were broad brush recitations of a judicial exception even to the point of the claims recite one or more of an abstract idea, a law of nature, something along those lines. They weren't even being specific as to which judicial exception. And on the occasions that they were specific, um, it would just be broadly stated as this is just a fundamental activity, uh, this is just a method of organizing human activities. Um, they weren't really identifying an explicit judicial exception. And so that's something that they are now required to do. And they also have to explain uh, why it's considered judicial exception. Uh, what about it? Is, it? is it fundamental? Is it you know, an abstract idea? What, what's going on here? Um, and then, as we mentioned before, the other elements in the claim have to be discussed. Uh, and if the examiner thinks that they don't add significantly more, the examiner has to explain why. So if the PTO interim guide, guidance is uh, it's friendlier to diagnostic innovations in some way uh, as compared to their prior guidelines. Uh, there's no explicit examples included in either the guidelines 
or in the examples accompanying the guidelines for diagnostics, it's our understanding from the PTO yesterday during their 101 roundtable discussion that they're in the process of drafting such examples and will be issuing those in the near future. I know there's no software guidelines either. <laughs> right. One, one bit of concern is that the, uh, there, there was the promise of, of examples for uh, software, well, not necessarily software, but abstract idea-related uh, uh, examples. And shortly after the guidelines were posted, if you looked on the PTO's website, they had a link to some examples of naturally occurring uh, uh, subject matter. And then they had a bullet that said, abstract idea examples coming soon. And, and I don't know if, it's, if we should read too much into this, but they've now even just completely taken that bullet off. So I don't know if they're coming soon. Uh, our understanding is that the PTO is putting together uh, some examples, but they are also asking for uh, examples to be submitted from the public uh, to give them something to go on. I think with the abstract idea, as with, as with a lot of practitioners, practitioners and patent applicants, um, everybody's kind of struggling with how you draw the line, and uh, the PTO is no exception there. Right. But we can look at the, new, the examples that accompany the guidelines do include some examples related to nucleic acids, which are which would be helpful to the diagnostics industry in and of itself. Uh, specifically, it's example uh, seven of the accompanying uh, examples, and it's to the nucleic acids. And they provide very, the, the examples include very detailed fact patterns as to what's in the specification, what's known uh, generally in the prior art, what, what occurs in nature, and then give very specific claims, uh, exemplary claims. And here, example seven included four claims. One is the isolated nucleic acid comprising Seq ID number one, which was identical to that found in nature. Two is the isolated nucleic acid comprising a sequence that has at least 90% identity to Seq ID number one. And it also specifies that there's at least one substitution modification relative to Seq ID number one. So it, and, you know, Based on the facts of this pattern, the, um, the particular gene has no mutations in nature. So this is clearly not the identical sequence found in nature, according to the example. Number three is the isolated nucleic acid of claim one, further comprising a fluorescent label attached to the nucleic acid, which was, you know, would be used in a diagnostic industry. And then four is a vector comprised in the nucleic acid of claim one and a heterologous nucleic acid sequence. And that heterologous nucleic acid sequence, came, and this fact pattern came from a, is from a different organism. So the analysis is no surprise. Claim one, according to the example, would be ineligible because this is the identical fact pattern to the original Supreme Court myriad decision. Um, but two, it, having, according to the PTO guidelines, Having a single structural difference in the nucleic acid sequence was sufficient to not be naturally occurring anymore. So to determine whether or not something is markedly different, you look to see if there's a different structure or function. And according to this fact pattern, the single nucleic acid modification is a different structure because it is not the identical sequence. Um, and potentially has a different function because, of course, you change the nucleic acid, you may change the protein for which it, the polypeptide for which it closed, um, codes. However, um, one thing that wasn't brought up in the guidelines though, that we were thinking about is that a later discovered natural product that actually contains that single mutation uh, may it end up rendering the claims invalid under 101. So even though they may survive a 101 attack now, you know, 10 years from, late, from now in which, you know, the sequence has just been changed over time, maybe naturally occurring, then uh, you may end up, uh, your claims may end up being invalid for 101 as an eligible subject matter. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, claim three, which is the fluorescent label attached to the, the, you know, in quotes, naturally occurring, uh, the isolated nucleic acid, the PTO says that would be, el uh, be eligible under 101. Of course, you would have to be concerned under 103 um, as to whether or not that that's a different test, <laughs> and you can get to that at a later date. Uh, because, of course, having the fluorescent label, it has both different structure because, of course, having the fluorescent label attached to the 
uh, particular nucleic acid sequence is not found in nature naturally. And then it also has a different function because you're using it as a label as opposed to just having the gene encoding a peptide. Uh, claim 4 is also eligible because it's a non-natural combination of sequences from different organisms, so therefore it's different function and different structure. And one thing I also wanted to add on the um, abstract idea examples, um, at the back of the guidelines there are several different examples uh, where the PTO walks through uh, the cases that they mentioned for when we listed out before the uh, examples of claims related to naturally occurring subject matter, claims related to um, uh, abstract ideas, the Patent Office does go through some of those older cases and identify how the guidelines uh, would have been applied in those cases and why uh, they would get to the same result um, under that analysis. So uh, that is some helpful guidance at least. You know, it's interesting to look back at some of those cases from the 70s and see how the, uh, the PTO is, is applying their guidelines to those cases. Um, but hopefully we'll also see some, some new examples uh, coming out soon. And so, of course, nothing is ever easy. Uh, and the very next day, after the PTO issued their interim guidelines, the Federal Circuit e issued its decision in the subsequent Myriad case, which was brought up to the Federal Circuit for appeal from a preliminary injunction. And there were two sets of claims at issue in this case. The first set was a, were primary claims, uh, which the representative composition claim is, re, uh, is provided on the slide, but essentially it's a pair of single-stranded DNA primers to be used to determine the nucleotide sequence of the BRCA1 gene and use those in a PCR reaction. And the Federal Circuit said claim is invalid under 101, it's not patentable subject matter because the primers are not distinguishable from the isolated DNA, and the primers necessarily contain the identical sequence of the BRCA1 sequence, which is directly opposite to the strand from which it's designed to bind. So the method claims are reproduced here on this slide, and uh, Claim 7 and 8 are the representative method claims, and they differ solely by the where-in clauses, which are contained at the end of the claim. So both 7 and 8 are directed to a method for screening a germline of a human subject for alteration of the BRCA1 gene, which requires um, comparing the germline sequence of the BRCA1 gene or BRCA1 RNA from a tissue sample and with the germline sequence of the wild type BRCA1. Uh, the, uh, and as I said, the two differ in that claim 7 requires uh, hybridizing the BRCA1 gene probe, and claim 8 requires uh, amplifying all or part of the BRCA1 gene using a set, set of primers. So they do have different determination methods, but they're going to the same general idea, which is the, the method of determining whether or not someone has the BRCA1 mutation. So the Federal Circuit looked at this and said, you know, we've already determined that the beginning parts of Claim 7 and 8, which are the methods, require merely comparing the patient's gene with the wild type and identifying any differences that arise, arise and that's an abstract idea. And so is there something more? Um, by this claim, and they looked at it, and it was interesting because they said the claim is very, the number of comparisons is unlimited, unlimited. It's not restricted by the purpose of comparison or alteration being detected. It covers detection of yet undiscovered alterations, and uh, even with respect to cancer, which was the intention, the comparisons are not limited to breast or ovarian cancer. So this, they said the claim was very, very, very broad, and so this is very much an abstract idea. So then you have to look at the particular mechanism for comparison up for the comparison. And here, as I had pointed out, is that claim seven requires hybridizing a BRCA gene probe and two, detecting the presence of a hybridization product, whereas claim eight requires amplifying the BRCA1 gene and sequencing the amplified nucleic acid. And is that enough to take it outside of uh, to put it into patent-eligible subject matter, 
And just as the Supreme Court has been saying, and um, it's been happening in all the 101 cases, that Federal Circuit came out and said, no, this is just routine, ordinary techniques. It doesn't take it anything outside of what practitioners already know, so there's really nothing inventive here. And so therefore, these claims, even which have specific steps, are still abstract ideas and uh, non-patent eligible. So people immediately came out and said, well, you know, are the PTO guidelines going to have to be revised in light of the new Federal Circuit Myriad case? It's unlikely. I can't imagine why, because the composition claims are similar to what is already addressed by the PTO guidelines. Um, you know, the Federal Circuit said the composition claims, the primer claims, are analogous to isolated DNA, which the PTO has said has addressed in their examples and in the, the guidelines. And the abstract idea part of it uh, was already before the Supreme Court in the earlier Myriad case. Uh, and the rationale as to the hybridization and the amplification part as to why that doesn't render it to be um, patentable subject matter is still addressed by the PTO guidelines. So it is unlikely that the PTO is going to revise its guidelines to take into account the recent Federal Circuit Myriad decision. So what do we do with diagnostic inventions? Uh, you know, previously people thought that diagnostic inventions were dead, there was no hope of getting a patent, uh, no hope of defending a patent. Uh, now, of course, You've got to remember the PTO guidelines are not law. They are not, I mean, these are just internal guidelines. The PTO is awaiting comment from the public. So they haven't even been put in place at the PTO, much less approved by the federal circuit. Uh, and so the law is changing. Where it goes, we don't know. <laughs> uh, but things are not dead. Right, and, and, and one thing to, to note, you know, if you can, we're not going to go all the way back to that slide, but if you think about the slide uh, that listed out all the cases since uh, 101 was enacted in, in 1952, there has been no further legislation on Section 101. Even when the AIA came out, it, they specifically avoided getting into what is considered patent eligible. And so all the law that we're dealing with now is court generated. We have the original uh, 101 statute in 1952. Um, it told us what the categories of matter are, but it wasn't until the 70s that we did not even identified some judicial exceptions. Uh, even the Chakra Party case, that's what said, you know, anything under the sun made by man. Uh, and so we're, we're certainly in a pendulum swing as the, uh, as the courts are, are changing, public perceptions change, and I think we're not going to have any real certainty on a lot of things um, until there is some legislation, but that I don't think is anywhere in our in our near future. So um, you know, we continue to to follow what the courts are doing and uh, and trying to uh, adjust our practices and uh, you know not only in light of what the courts have done, but also to anticipate uh, what they're doing. So you know, one question that that you might have is: Is it worth continuing to invest in our, our diagnostic methods or our diagnostic tools and different practices that, that you're doing. Um, and it's you know, certainly any time that you are, are looking to uh, protect your innovation, um, you know, it's important to consider these questions that we've put up here. But certainly if you find that this is the type of innovation that is going to come under 101 scrutiny uh, in front of the patent office or in front of the courts, just some things to think about. And we'll get into specific practice tips in a little bit, but I know a, a lot of you after the uh, case law that has come out and, and the, the recent fluctuations over the past four or five years in uh, subject matter eligibility, you're having to answer real questions on, well, how much, how much budget do I put forth uh, to, to protecting certain innovation? What are my likely of success? What do I do with these patents that have issued uh, or, or applications which were filed before these, uh, these recent rule changes. I think these are some questions you, know, you have to ask yourself. You know, how important is it? Um, that, of course, I think underscores everything. Um, but then look at some of the, uh, the things that the guidelines are looking for. Are there physical things involved? 
are you able to take uh, you know, show show differences these markedly different characteristics you know from a naturally occurring substance to, to what you've created um, are you transforming anything um, even if you if you are looking on the on the software side of things you know are you uh, implementing it in, in a technological way going back to the myriad and the abstract idea do you have specific steps that are um, really revolutionary in how you're doing something or is it just you know, are, are you just making observations um, or are you really making a difference and, and changing the industry there um, how will your company be implementing it if at all uh, what is your what is your strategy for gaining value that's what these these questions kind of get to and, and things that you have to ask yourself um, as you're deciding uh, what to what to move forward with um, so for your current portfolio uh, things that you want to do and we'll start we'll start with the old stuff and then and get to the new stuff um, so so the things that have already issued which are currently in your portfolio um, those should probably be evaluated for one-on-one -on -one vulnerability um, you may have a significant amount of, of uh, patents or claims in your portfolio where this isn't going to be an issue. Um, some who, who are focused more on developing diagnostic tools or uh, methods of analysis may have more of an issue with this than those that are actually producing um, the, uh, the, the structures themselves. But uh, even, even then, you still have to consider what your claims look like and whether or not under these guidelines uh, there could be an issue. A few different ways that you can do that. Um, you know, either do it by subject matter, trying to, to analyze as you're coming up on broadening reissue dates, um, as your maintenance fees becomes due. These are just sort of key time points where you might want to take a look at your portfolio to, uh, to figure out how to uh, best allocate your, uh, your IP uh, dollars there. Um, and then where you find an issue, go ahead and take action. You know, figure out what the value is, and pursue remedial measures. There, there are actually a number of, of options available. Um, you know, if you're within the first two years, uh, you can look at a broadening reissue uh, to try and correct the, the one-on-one concern. Uh, supplemental examination is an interesting option. So normally, a, a, you may be familiar with ex parte re-exams. Um, and there where the patent office will take another look at an issued patent. Um, and it can be requested by the patent owner itself, um, but usually ex parte re-exams are only open on the basis of patents or printed publications that constitute prior art. But supplemental exam is a method where you just identify that there's something wrong with the claims. And maybe you look at them and these patents issued before some of these decisions. Um, you can present that to the patent office and they have a special exception for 101 if they find that there's an issue in the claims uh, because of you know, there's now a 101 issue, they will actually uh, open up an ex parte re-exam just to address the 101 issue. So that's, that's an option that's available as well. So as we mentioned earlier, showing that, if it's possible, showing that your um, claim or the law of nature in your claim is markedly different than the you know, what its naturally occurring counterpart is going to be easier to overcome a one-on-one -on -one rejection at the patent office. And you can do this, you know, it would be best if you can for a new application to do it up front and consider the examples that accompanies the interim guidelines. Um, you know, again, focus on the difference in structure, focus on the difference in function between the naturally occurring counterpart. Try to include prop those different properties in the application itself. Um, of course, you have to worry about dealing with, you know, if you're saying something is the prior art to show that this is different than uh, um, the naturally occurring product, then you have, might have to, you know, you might have walked yourself into a 103 rejection by admitting, putting an admission on the record. Uh, so it has to be done very carefully. But do consider at least including that information in the application when you draft it. It'll save time and money when you're prosecuting the application later if you can just refer to the specification as opposed to having to submit an expert declaration um, to, to prove the markedly different uh, structure or function. One other thing, yeah, that, that doesn't just go for the naturally occurring uh, subject matter. That goes for abstract ideas as well. 
a lot of the issues that the courts have when they find an abstract idea in the claim is that there's just not enough else in the claim to really focus it in so that they can see how it's being implemented in a particular way uh, that doesn't preempt sort of the overall concept. Um, a lot of times, especially just given the way that um, application drafting strategy has changed over I guess, the past decade, really, um, to in, in oftentimes include less information, less specific examples because of the desire to you know, not unnecessarily limit your claims. Um, a lot of times when you're talking about method steps or um, different concepts like that, software applications, other things, uh, there's not a whole lot of description there. You might say, well, you generally want to do A, B, and C, but not a lot of description on how that happens or a specific use case, things like that. Um, including that kind of detail uh, really helps. Uh, if you need to amend your claims later on, um, or if you want to include a picture claim uh, along with uh, your other more broad claims, you know, just to try and, and get around some of the one-on-one -on -one concerns. For an existing application, uh, you know, you might want to consider drafting your claims to compositions that are markedly different from nationally occurring products. For example, if you have, you know, something in your specification where you have specific sequences and you've identified them as having 90% homology, but you have one particular sequence that has a different sequence than that of the naturally occurring product or counterpart, you might want to pursue that particular sequence as opposed to trying to go after the broader claim with the 90% homology, which would encompass both. Uh, so you, you may want to consider that, uh, especially considering you know, later identified naturally occurring products could render a claim that you think is perfectly fine at this stage. Uh, you know, having that narrower claim is going to certainly help you survive a 101 subject matter attack at a later date. And again, consider preparing a declaration to submit data to establish the markedly different characteristics. Um, again, try to rely only on the significantly more prongs of Part 2B of the Mayo test. Only if there are no markedly different characteristics. I know for some inventions, it's impossible to not have to rely on that prong. But if you can, you know, try to get, try not to get to that test in the first place. Uh, and one way of doing that is to establish multiple markedly different characteristics to support eligibility. And that way, you know, if it's also on the record to say, well, my product, the claim composition differs from the naturally occurring product in A, B, C, and D, someone's going to have to establish that a later discovered uh, composition meets all of those uh, characteristics of A, B, and C, and D. And as we've mentioned multiple times, be prepared for surprises. Uh, this is a rapidly evolving area of patent law. You need to you know, put a lot of thought and consideration into drafting an important patent application, you know, one that really encompasses your, your company's technology. Uh, you know, probably, maybe, depending on circum circumstances, it may be better to put more time and resources into drafting one application as opposed to filing multiple uh, quick applications um, and really putting a lot of time and effort into uh, developing a, a very well-written application. And then this slide you know, it says practice tips for diagnostic tools, not really just tools. It's also you know, methods of treatment where you might have an abstract idea that's an issue. But for, for these types of inventions, uh, in your prosecution, you may have to address the scope and applicability of an identified abstract idea. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like crystal ball gazing, I think, not just for us, but for examiners. Um, when they're faced with a claim, and they feel like there's an abstract idea, how do you identify what that abstract idea is? Now, it's one thing if the claim actually recites a mathematical algorithm, but if it's a method of steps, how do they say, well, this is just an you know, X idea. Uh, this is just a method of observing uh, you know, a particular reaction. This is just a method of you know, having a computer you know, do, do 
a particular transaction or process, a particular thing. Um, so a couple of things that you may consider doing is, you know, maybe there's a, an expert declaration that you can submit to rebut examiner positions. Uh, certainly in the electronics and software side of things, uh, expert declarations are rarely used. But if you've gotten a rejection from an examiner saying the abstract idea is X, uh, and that's just a fundamental concept, um, maybe you should submit an expert declaration to show that, no, that idea is not fundamental. In fact, it only came about you know, a couple years ago. Here's the problems that were in the industry. Um, this is what the state of the art was like at the time um, to help show that either the abstract idea isn't really a fundamental issue, or maybe that there's something more in the claims. Okay, examiner, you've said the abstract idea is X, but let me tell you why these claims are important, not just based on what's in the specification, but you know, an expert in the field telling you why they're important. Uh, that can also be helpful in cases where your specification may not be as solidly drafted as uh, you know, wish it were uh, to include some of that information. Um, the machine or transformation test is, is something that, uh, that is still considered. It's sort of one of those things you say out of the side of your mouth because the, uh, the Supreme Court has, uh, has not necessarily put it in disfavor, um, but they've said that, well, that's not the only test. Let's look at these other tests. You can't have a bright line test. But the Federal Circuit still continues to apply the machine or transformation test, and the guidelines uh, mention that as well. You know, passing the machine or transformation test is not a guarantee of patent eligibility, but it's certainly an argument in your favor. And if you can show it, it gets you that much closer to being found 101 eligible. Uh, if you have a, a tool that is running software, try and compare and contrast your claims to recent software examples. We have the DDR Holdings case out of the Federal Circuit uh, just uh, recently, it was past December, where um, the claims were actually fell, actually held to be statutory, and that was a software case um, specifically because the technology was necessary and fundamental to the invention. So the inventive concept wasn't just applied on a computer, but the computer was essential in that case. Uh, Ultramercial is the opposite. Uh, that's a case you might want to contrast your claims with um, so that you can point out the distinctions there. Don't be afraid to amend your claims. A lot of times we try not to amend because we want broader subject matter. But certainly, you know, when you're dealing with a case where one-on-one is an issue, this idea of as broad as possible may not be the best. Even if you can get it around the examiner, uh, you're likely going to have trouble in the courts. So uh, consider whether strategically narrowing your claim could help. Maybe there's a way to do it. Maybe you break one broad independent claim up into several smaller focused uh, independent claims. It's a little bit more cost at, at uh, you know, for the additional claim fees and things like that, but if it helps you get a patent, um, might be quite useful. And then there's going to be those cases where you strategically delay or, or abandon them. You, know, you look at them and realize, wow, this was, this was written in another era where we didn't have this kind of guidance. It's going to be a real struggle to get these claims, and when I look back at my spec, it just doesn't have the detail that I need. Um, so you may have to make those decisions. And of course, when you are making the claim amendment, you should consider any divided infringement Absolutely. defenses that you know any potential infringers may raise. Uh, so again, that may be another reason to go very, very narrow with your claims so that you capture one potential infringing party as opposed to having very broad claims that might capture multiple uh, parties performing the different steps. Right, definitely an issue for method of treatment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's what's left of diagnostics? Well, we think quite a bit. We're still we're still positive about it, and and I think the keys are that you think about it strategically when you get a one 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 hundred one rejection, or you know, try and just make your your applications as strong as possible to avoid them in the first place. Um, but we hope that this presentation has been helpful, and uh, thank you all for attending. I'll turn it back over to Erin. Great. So we appreciate your participation in today's presentation. Again, as I've noted, if you're interested in receiving a copy of today's presentation or a link to where this recording will be published and available online um, shortly, please send an email to myself at erinwest at eWest at um, And 
Thank you so much. You can, you're welcome to disconnect your line now.